uh, in the exercise five. So you first uh, come up with the markets, say two, three, four markets of options, and then you flip the page and you basically ask yourself a few questions. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the questions is about market situation, and this question of where, again, yeah, to, to the best of your knowledge, I'm not asking you to do the formal market research, or you know, spend five thousand dollars to buy the market report. Um, I'll tell you about that later on how we can cost effectively do that. Um, uh, but yes, you, to the best of your knowledge, and where where is the most, where is the most number of the ideal buyers? Where do I have? Where exactly I have the niche in this say three or four markets? Uh, where I have the connections? Um, I had an interesting case uh, of the gentleman who uh, their company was producing like the special lockers for like cattle, um, and they got some sales in Norway and Iceland. Those aren't you know, typical markets, especially for this type of products. But the only reason they got it is because they have they had like some sort of personal connections to the potential buyers in the market. Yeah, those aren't number one markets for the product, but they, they could do it. And, and, and you can too. Again, if your market is not there, for example, it's not in the least, it doesn't mean it's bad market now. If you have connections, especially to the buyers, then you have pretty much 50% of the job done. Uh, where the business culture is most familiar to you, that's, that goes back to your point, gentlemen, about uh, you know, being able to say, negotiate in specific regions like Turkey, like Middle East, uh, China, and pretty much any other uh, country or you know, part of the world that uh, does not speak the language we do. Um, and uh, where in, in, in other, in the final consideration is where my product is the most competitive. Now that goes back to the value proposition and keep in mind that the price is not only the answer. Sorry, it's not the only answer. Uh, if you can deliver goods faster, if your product is of higher quality, it, uh, then the market where your product is the most you pick the market where your product is the most competitive. So, uh, where the buyers say perceive quality, prefer quality over price, for example. Right? Okay. Any questions on market selection? Uh, we can run a few other queries if you want uh, on a break. If you want to, you know, check your personal case, your situation. But uh, if you change the trade flow, flow uh, you can also get the data on imports of the particular products to Canada or to any other market. The beauty of the United Nations database is that you can play with uh, data and uh, like literally run you know, the queries from around the world, you know, importing from, exporting from you know, uh, Germany to Italy or vice versa or something like that. So you're not, you're, you're not limited to Canada. Only. Okay? Any questions on market selection? Yes. Is it needed to do uh, the pestle analysis and the put aside analysis to find out what is the right market or the market you want? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Um, it's, but the, the thing is that it's more, uh, it's a next step. You're right. So once you identify a few markets, then you look deeper into it. Uh, in our like, full today's uh, workshop, uh, we'll also go through the resources um, of information for detailed research. This is where you like, really dive deep and you know, do all of those analysis. Um, uh, you can also use the reports. Like, there's quite a lot of reports that are readily available. Uh, just a tip for you, unfortunately, uh, people don't know that, but normally if you want to buy the market report, it's expensive. Uh, but the public libraries in Canada, they have access to many of those reports free of charge. So you can speak to a librarian. Um, also, if you have a friend or a family member who is the student of Canadian College University, um, the college and university libraries have access to even greater number of those reports. Because they are considered to be scientific reports, 
and they contain the summary of uh, certain markets and projections for the next few years. Country reports? Yeah. The example could be, I don't know, um, let's see, food markets of United Arab Emirates or you know, meat market of China, something like that. So there's quite a lot of, of those reports. Yes? And uh, how far out those projections are in terms of the market growth and they go? And are they accurate? Have you, what's your experience? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely accurate. Uh, of course, there are different sources. You know, some of them are you know, more or less reputable. Uh, <clears throat> but what I also noticed is that you know, there are quite a lot of brokers, like report brokers, and it's kind of the same report, but by the same report from different uh, brokers. Usually, the, usually if, um, my, my criteria is that if the library has it, then it's a credible resource. Yes? And those typically, the reports, are they a governmental uh, agency, or is it, or is it they deal with a, a marketing uh, company that sells yeah, the reports? Either marketing companies or the research institutions, universities. And what's the, what's, what is the example of a good um, uh, research institute or a company well, yeah, I can't tell you right now, uh, right out of my head. Uh, but you know, my criteria, criteria is usually, uh, if the library has it, then it's good. Yeah, so I don't really, I don't really too much, uh, go too much deep into the authors of the reports, but rather where I get it. Okay. Uh, let's take a short break. Yeah? I have one question. Sure. Yeah, CPTPP. Yeah, exactly. CPTPP. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because right. I, I was just thinking there, like, there is a demand in Mexico. Yeah. But maybe the food is pretty hard. Correct. So, how can I know a little bit more about like, how the, the new agreement will be affected with that story so I can start like, maybe doing some research? Right. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a little bit easy to answer because uh, if. Uh, First of all, uh, CPTPP is the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership Agreement. is a new agreement that Canada signed with multiple countries across the Pacific, including Mexico. So what that means is that um, all products are originated in that particular um, uh, group of countries will be duty-free when traded between the countries. Yet even though Canada already has NAFTA agreement with Mexico, um, what uh, Cindy's question I believe is about is okay if uh, I'm buying the Japanese product and importing it to Mexico, right? Uh, when that Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is fully implemented, it will mean that 99% of Japanese products will be duty-free in Mexico, and 99% of uh, Mexican products in Japan will be duty-free, and also there will be significant reduction of the uh, non-tariff barriers. Uh, another good example, now the problem, the only problem is that the agreement is signed, but it will take a few years to implement. There is another good example, uh, which is CETA, uh, the agreement between Canada and the European Union. This is the one that is already enforced, which means that Canadian, like 98 to 99% percent of Canadian goods are duty free in Europe right now. Doesn't matter which product is that, it, from like you know vehicle to uh, you know uh, kind of maple syrup, um, uh, and uh, vice versa. Ninety-nine percent of European goods are duty free in Canada. Yes. I just want to make a recommendation for people who who want to export like you uh, from Canada to Mexico. We actually we are a custom broker there. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, many problems when the merchandise arrives to Mexico because sometimes the HTS number changes change the, the sometimes. When you issue the NAFTA certificate mm -hmm. can change the tariff uh, number mm -hmm. and can make uh, some pro troubles there, uh, such as uh, govern uh, government uh, regulations and taxes do. 
And sometimes you uh, you can change when when you change the HDS number and uh, different uh, from Canada. Mm -hmm. And when the merchandise arrives in Mexico, you can make uh, you can uh, have many kind of problems. And I recommend you uh, ask to a custom broker in Mexico before you uh, send the merchandise. Also, you have great point. Many kind of problems. Great point. Great point. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely uh, the uh, dealing with reputable customs broker is uh, super important. And the income terms. Uh, we we do sometimes different as around the world, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, such as uh, X works yeah. or Java or. Well, let's let's talk about that after the break. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Okay. We're gonna talk about that after the break. Okay. okay. Uh, and please, guys, uh, uh, grab some food and drinks and also network because the best uh, outcome of this workshop is if we have a deal in the end of it between some of you.
importing from Mexico, right? Yeah. Food products. Mm -hmm. Do you have to register? Right, yeah, it's, it's very lost. <laughs> lost oh, yeah, we're going to talk yeah, about yeah. it. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, I can tell you right now. Um, yeah. uh, you, you have to get the import number. So, also, like a business number? Like a business number, yes. Oh, okay. But you can import number, it's a business Uh, it's just a little bit more. Uh, th there is a different custom store, but of course, yeah, you can import as an individual. You can you know, come in. Yeah, because I think at the beginning you need to have a Right, uh, this is basically. Uh, because yeah, I'm not registered like a business, like a, and I'm well, registered like a